myself. I'm Zach Cintron. Uh, if you guys don't know me, I know most of you already. Um, I am one of the sports directors and I do oversee bowling for Special Olympics Maryland. Um, and this is going to be our preseason coaches webinar. Um, we are going to go through a lot of return to activities protocol stuff. Um, getting back into practice this year uh, is much more about safety than typical. and We're very much about safety in the first place. So we're going to work through some of that stuff tonight. We will talk about some bowling stuff. Um, we will take some questions if you have them. Uh, tonight, joining me, uh, besides myself, is Rich Domros and Rob Wright from our bowling SMT. Uh, Mike Sarnowski, our VP of Sports, is joining us. And then uh, Steve Bennett is not joining us tonight, uh, but he wishes he could be here to see all of you as well. Um, moving along here, uh, just some of the things kind of getting you prepped for the, the night with the agenda. Uh, of course, the first thing we're going to kind of hit here is, is Zoom. Uh, I think most of us have been on Zoom in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so if you haven't been on Zoom recently, again, like I mentioned before, before we got things rolling, if you need to ask a question, feel free to type it into your chat function. Um, and if not, feel free to type it into um, the chat or raise your hand. Raising your hand will give us a, a visual to let us know that hey, uh, this person is looking to ask a question and we can open up your line from there. Um, again, we're gonna very heavily in this preseason webinar cover the return to activities requ requirement and protocol. Um, again, it's how you get your programs back in action in person safely. Uh, we wanna see our athletes out there bowling, but we definitely wanna do it in the safest way possible. Uh, we will hit a review of some bowling stuff, a lot of stuff that you've seen in the past. Um, some stuff that's competition oriented. So we'll move a little bit quickly through there. Um, and then we'll, we'll hit some other resources that you guys uh, typically know of, do a refresher of those kind of things. And then we'll open the floor up for a discussion for questions that you may have at the end. Um, again, just a reminder, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to type them in the chat and or raise your hand. Um, as you can see, as it pops up on the little box that we put below, uh, but at this point, I am going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm actually going to give Mr. Sarnowski the controls here. Uh, give me a second to promote Mike to our co-host. And now, Mike, you are good to take over the reins here with the PowerPoint for the Return to Activities Protocol. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see a lot of familiar faces. Let me... Get this set here. And hopefully everyone can see my screen, the agenda, and we're back. So um, uh, Zach, you can see the, uh, the return to activity title slide? Yep, we're good to go. Great, thank you. So um, for all of the uh, sports where we've done the preseason webinars to date, um, since this uh, COVID situation uh, came to be, uh, we've gone through this. Uh, what you see there uh, is a copy of our overall return to activities protocol. Uh, it's available uh, in um, on our website, uh, and I'm sure Zach will send it out to folks uh, as um, uh, an attachment. Uh, uh, or at least the link to that when we um, uh, follow up fo after the session uh, this evening. Um, it is a uh, living document, for lack of a better term, uh, in that uh, we are adding things to it as, um, uh, particularly now as we're getting into some of the sports that have an indoor uh, component to them, we uh, are adding some additional uh, components. There, there will be some specific sections uh, related to each of the indoor sports, bowling being the first. Uh, so the most of the protocol itself won't change, but um, there will be a specific uh, additional page or two related to, to bowling. That is still being um, uh, developed. Uh, we hope to have that in the next uh, week or so, uh, so that you can have that and have that available to, uh, to use with your, um, uh, with your programs. Uh, and will certainly be available for any questions that uh, may come up along with that. Um, as we're going through and looking at returning to activity, uh, a few things to keep in mind here. Um, uh, 
this can only be successful by uh, you working with your area leadership. Um, the, as we go through and talk through the protocol uh, that we have here, and again, we'll, uh, we'll spend some time here, but it will still be going through relatively quickly. Um, keep in mind, these are not recommendations, these are requirements. Uh, and it also means that not every program is going to be ready to offer in-person in training uh, at this point in time. Many are. Uh, we've had, um, uh, I would guess, probably about half of the area programs in Maryland have been offering this um, uh, training to date, uh, give or take, uh, but your program may not be ready, uh, and that's okay. Um, but work with your area leadership to work through that. Uh, it may also mean, uh, as we go through the protocol, that not every athlete uh, will be able to participate. Uh, if they can't follow uh, the protocol uh, and, and the requirements, like staying six feet apart from each other uh, and no uh, direct contact, if they can't adhere to that, then they aren't ready uh, to come back uh, to play uh, and to activity. And, uh, um, and that also is okay, uh, but it will be, need to be adhered to. I should also point out here that, these, that this protocol that we're going through, uh, while there are some certain specific things related to Maryland, uh, it is uh, nationwide, actually worldwide. Uh, and, um, and so it's not just something that we cooked up. This is something that Special Olympics is requiring across the board. Um, that uh, as with this, as with any training program, um, there are all the requirements for athlete medicals, volunteer applications, certifications, so on down the line. They still apply during this training period or during this return to activity period. So um, uh, it's just it's additional things that you need to watch for um, and need to apply. Um, but uh, they all still apply to that. Uh, every program is going to start in phase one. That's a multi-phase program. Uh, and uh, as noted, again, there's an, it's an evolving process. You see the link there to our virtual SOMD page. Uh, there's a, a return to play or return to activity page that's on there. Uh, and um, the materials we've got here, as well as uh, additional materials and links to different videos and all are available on that page. Um, in addition, uh, and this can be helpful for some of your athletes, uh, we had three sessions uh, earlier this year, uh, as we were going through this, um, uh, to help athletes learn the new protocols. Uh, these are not um, uh, repeats of each other. These are three sort of successive sessions uh, that your athletes can uh, participate in, with the third one being basically a game show, uh, sort of a Jeopardy type game uh, that they can uh, participate in as a review. Uh, so these are available to you. Again, you'll get the deck here and all these uh, uh, recordings are available on that return to activity or return to play uh, website. Again, uh, I don't want to be too repetitive. Um, this does uh, cover not just training, but all in-person activities. So it does it practices and training, certainly. It also applies to any meetings within Special Olympics, any competitions within Special Olympics, any fundraising events, et cetera. Um, so we've had a couple small competitions, uh, two uh, small golf competitions and a flag football skills competition uh, to date. Uh, we've got another five or six lined up in the near future. Uh, these same protocols need to, are, have to be in place and need to be ad adhered to there uh, for all of those as well. One other thing so that uh, folks aren't confused, um, uh, as you'll note there that uh, school systems and 30 third party programs um, may have their own guidelines. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our high school interscholastic unified sports program. Um, that program, uh, when they're operating within their school system, they are adhering to the protocol or the requirements of the school system and that will supersede what we have here. So there is a possibility that uh, you may see some things that have the name Special Olympics next to them that are a little different from what we're covering here, uh, but those in, in most cases are gonna be things associated with school systems that they're applying uh, and operating there. As I mentioned, this is a, um, uh, it's a, we call it a four phase program, but it goes up to phase three. Um, and we'll go through these in, in some detail. Notice with the arrow that's down here, um, while in most cases, hopefully areas or programs are moving 
from phase zero to phase one to phase two to phase three. It is also possible that based on um, uh, any number of factors, uh, a program could drop from say phase two down to phase one uh, or go to a, another uh, lower phase. So phase zero, we've all been through this. Nothing is happening. Um, uh, everyone's staying at home uh, and so on. Uh, now we're in phase one. Uh, for most programs. Um, again, where we can have some activity, uh, it's limited to uh, 10 or fewer participants uh, need to adhere to uh, strict physical distancing of at least six feet throughout. There's no direct or indirect contact. Uh, direct contact is when a person touches another person. So uh, a handshake or uh, whatever, um, high five, uh, et cetera, or just, you know, a coach uh, is uh, guiding an athlete's arm through uh, a bowling motion. Uh, if, there, if there's contact there, that's direct contact. Indirect contact uh, is when um, uh, you touch, uh, you, you pick up a bowling ball and, uh, you know, put it down on, uh, on a ramp and then the athlete touches the bowling ball, basically uh, where you touched uh, two different people have touched the same object without it being sanitized between there. When we're in phase one, indirect contact like that is not permitted. Uh, and again, uh, tied with that, no sharing of equipment, et cetera. Uh, in phase one also, uh, pre-event pre screening needs to take place. There's some other paperwork things we'll go through, um, but uh, each athlete, each participant, not just each, each athlete, each coach, each volunteer, uh, each unified partner, if you have that, is screened on site. Phase two, uh, which um, uh, after a program has been in phase one for a, uh, a couple weeks uh, and has been successful at that, uh, they could potentially move to phase two. Right now, Maryland has, I believe, three, uh, it's either three or four areas that are in phase two, have uh, just recently, actually within the last week or so, moved from phase one up to phase two. Uh, in phase two, Groups uh, can be up to 50 people. Um, they still need to have that physical distancing and no direct contact is permitted, but indirect contact can resume. So that uh, again, still in phase two, can't uh, physically touch another person, um, but uh, the, there's no need to um, uh, clean objects or whatever. You could hand uh, an athlete a bowling ball or uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, and again, their uh, pre-event screening needs to take place. One thing to note also here, when we're talking about groups of uh, 10 or fewer in phase one or 50 or fewer in phase two, uh, it is possible, depending upon the layout and the, uh, the facility that you're using, that you could have more than one group participating at a given time. Uh, so they could have, um, you could have, uh, um, you know, a group of 10, say you're in phase one, in one uh, part of the uh, bowling alley or for an outside, outside event um, uh, in one section, and then uh, a second group uh, at another location uh, further apart, as long as there's, I think it's a uh, 50 feet or more of distance that needs to be between them. So it is possible to have more than one grouping, um, but it does add challenges. Uh, and then again, phase three, uh, where no restrictions on size or gatherings uh, and public facilities uh, would take place. Um, uh, I'm sorry, so phase three is when essentially we're back to normal. We're back to uh, what had been normal there. So again, uh, you can move from phase one to phase two and then to phase three. It will likely be quite a while till we're in phase three uh, and then can move back. One other thing to note, um, right now, uh, the Special Olympics protocol are in general um, uh, more restrictive than what the state government uh, protocol might be. Um, if a situation changes and uh, the state government uh, becomes more restrictive, the, uh, the state of Maryland says no groups of 25, uh, larger than 25, then we would be going by that more strict um, requirement. So. If the state has, uh, um, you know, uh, some other restrictions, um, uh, then we would follow that, regardless of whether we're in phase two uh, at that time. We would lower that number down to 25 uh, and would stick with that. Okay. Um, 
really quick. Uh, I have a question real quick. Yeah. Okay. You said that a, you said that a program would start out in phase one for a minimum of a couple of weeks. Is that for each different sport? Or once they've done phase one in one sport, can they start in phase two for the uh, uh, subsequent sports automatically? Good question, yes. Uh, and the answer to that in general is yes. So it's, it applies to the area rather than to um, the particular sport. Um, the, the, there may be a variation based on a, you know, if there's a, a completely different group of people who are doing um, or uh, overseeing it, uh, you know, we may want to keep an eye on it a little bit closer, but, uh, but yes, it, it, it would apply to the area and even uh, within the, um, uh, on the shore, uh, it can be broken out and can apply to some degree by county uh, so that if, uh, so at one point, um, uh, Worcester County um, uh, with uh, Ocean City and such had, um, uh, was in a more severe um, uh, situation in terms of uh, what the state was observing there. Uh, and uh, it's possible that, um, you know, we would make a distinction within the county rather than just the area. But, but yes, it applies to the area uh, in general. So hopefully that answers that. Okay. Any other questions with that? I'm okay. not seeing anything else right now, Mike. Okay, so Zach, you want to go ahead and pop up um, the poll, the uh, first poll it's for live. phases one and two? Okay, so what we'd like you to do, please, if you would, is um, go through and uh, check off which of the following items that are here would be permitted when the program's operating in phase one. So, and when you're done, be sure to click the submit button at the bottom. And we'll give you a couple moments there. I know it's a lot to read. Okay, and again, here we're talking about operating in phase one. Um, here. Okay, and if it's in the way of you reading the slide behind it, you should be able to drag the poll box left or right. Okay, let's give another moment or two. Yep, we're almost we're almost at our max number here. Okay. Give it another you know, five or six seconds here, and then we're going to close it out and we will move along. Okay. All right. Okay. Now let's see the results. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read all these to you, but uh, it looks like you guys nailed it. So um, uh, the guiding the arm through the motion uh, that would require direct contact, um, handing the equipment to the athletes, that would be indirect contact, um, uh, which uh, is not permitted in phase one, uh, but demonstrating from eight feet away, perfect. Using the poly spots or marking, that's actually a great idea to do, um, uh, to, to see um, some physical distancing uh, and giving the athlete or the, uh, the participant a visual marker for that. Um, throwing a football back and forth, that's indirect contact because they're each touching the football. Um, and then uh, kicking the ball to an open goal is permitted. Uh, but once you put that additional person in there as a goalie, um, that would make it uh, indirect contact. Some folks are wondering, well, don't we need to get the ball back out of the goal back to the, <laughs> to the soccer player? Uh, yeah, but you could sanitize it before there. The actual act of kicking it into the open goal would be permitted. Okay, uh, and Zach, I think we do the second poll here as well. Let me go ahead and launch that. Second poll is live now. Okay, so here, uh, again, check off each of the people here that would be counted in either phase one or phase two towards the total number of uh, allowed participants.
All right, we'll give it another 10 more seconds here. We almost have all of our responses in. All right, I'm going to end the polling okay. and share those results. Yeah, and, and that looks pretty good. Um, so you, certainly, yes, athletes, uh, it includes that. It also includes, yes, unified partners, assistant coaches, coaches, volunteers. Basically, it includes in that total of 10 or fewer or 50 or fewer, depending upon the phase, anybody who is in that immediate area, uh, whether they are participating in the activity or not. So the family members who come down to the training location to observe would count, but a family member who stays either in the parking lot or observes from 50 meters away or from a distance away uh, would not. Um, so it, with bowling, you have sort of the, the, um, uh, the not unique, but the different uh, challenge that folks are coming indoors. Uh, and so yeah, basically anybody who's coming indoors would need to be, um, and, and is anywhere near where you're doing your activity would count towards your total. And we realize that that makes it a little bit more challenging. Uh, with things there. Okay, uh, go ahead and uh, close that down, Zach. Thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, again, let's go along. So these next two slides, I am not going to read all these to you. I do encourage you to read them um, when you get the slide deck and also they are included. They've basically been extracted from that uh, return to activity guide that I had mentioned, but it breaks out by phase um, the different components. So um, or different uh, aspects to think about. So when we're in phase one uh, and we're looking at uh, compliance, we're ensuring we're complying with all local and national regulations as is the case in phase two and phase three uh, and ensure you're following the, the policy. Um, educating in um, or all cases across the board, we're looking at prior to attending, educating all participants on uh, high risk conditions, um, uh, the requirements that anyone who has symptoms stay at home, and we'll talk through those symptoms in a moment, uh, and uh, PPE, et cetera. Uh, strongly recommend utilizing online meetings uh, and um, uh, the ability Zoom that's free uh, for up to 40 minutes, and you can do it that way. Uh, I understand not every athlete, not every family can access uh, Zoom or has uh, um, Wi-Fi access. Uh, but you can take care of this for many folks and strongly recommend not waiting until your first practice, do this in advance. Um, uh, and then uh, also at that point, you can collect and fill out uh, the uh, acknowledgement of risk forms, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, that each person who's participating needs to, to uh, complete in advance. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so again, for uh, when we're preparing, um, uh, again, the acknowledgement of risk forms um, uh, and so on. Uh, minim plan around minimizing uh, shared equipment, whichever level that you're at. Having hand sanitizer, having other PPE um, uh, materials available for their, um, having athletes, and, and not just athletes, but any of your participants bring their own mask, bring their own water bottle, bring their own towel, et cetera, on down the line. And you can review that during your preparation and then during the activity applying um, to uh, all, the, uh, all the requirements that are there. Again, please do read this at, um, when you uh, have the materials uh, with you and have the, the, the guide and such that Zach will send out following the session. Um, what I'd like to do, and let's keep our fingers crossed that so we can play this. And if we can uh, watch this short video that's available also online. In order to safely return to activity, Special Olympics recommends that participants wear a mask if on public transport, such as a bus, trolley, subway, or if carpooling with someone not living with them. If Special Olympics is providing transportation, face masks during travel and maintaining physical distance are required. Prior to entering any activity, practice, event, or gathering, all athletes, coaches, unified partners, volunteers, family members, and caregivers must participate in an on-site screening. It is important to take the necessary steps to create a safe on-site screening area. One, 
create a single point of entry. One entryway that allows participants to enter one at a time. Remember, we strongly advise outdoor spaces only in Phase 1. 2. Use chalk, tape, cones, or other markers to indicate what 6 feet or 2 meters looks like for physical distancing. 3. Make sure you have all the necessary supplies for a proper screening, which include temporal thermometer, pens, masks, gloves, disinfectant wipes or spray, hand sanitizer, COVID-19 participant code of conduct and risk assessment forms. Volunteers will fill out a monitoring form for each participant that passes through screening. The form includes the participant's name, contact info, temperature, answers to screening questions, and the outcome of the screening. For instance, can they participate or have they been isolated and sent home? Next, you will ask each participant the following required screening questions. We recommend using visual aids when asking the questions. 1. In the last 14 days, have you had contact with someone who has been sick with COVID-19? 2. Have you had a fever in the last week? Temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, 37.8 degrees Celsius, or higher? 3. Do you have a cough and or difficulty breathing? 4. Do you have any other signs or new symptoms of COVID-19? Fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, or diarrhea? In the past 14 days, have you had contact with someone who has been sick with COVID? Yes. Yes, you have? Okay, so I'm gonna actually have you step down here. If a participant answers yes to any questions, they must be isolated from the group, sent home, and instructed to contact their healthcare provider. Participants who are found to have COVID-19 symptoms must wait seven days after symptoms resolve to return to activity, or must provide written proof of physician clearance to Special Olympics to return to activities. Participants who test positive or have COVID-19 must provide written medical clearance before returning to sport and fitness activities. After answering the screening questions, you will conduct on-site measurement of participants' temperatures using a thermometer, preferably a non-touch thermal scanning one if possible. If a thermometer is not available, you must ask participants to self-monitor and provide results of that monitoring. If there are any concerns about fever, temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, 37.8 degrees Celsius, or higher, the participant should not be allowed to remain on site. If high, you may retest the participant after five minutes to ensure temperature is accurate. Record all names, results, and contact information using the template provided and keep in case needed for contact tracing or reporting. For more information on Special Olympics Return to Activity Protocol and Safety Guidelines, visit resources.specialolympics.org or consult your local program. Okay. So, as was noted there, uh, the, a walk through the screening process, you also may have noticed a number of uh, folks from uh, from Maryland, uh, the, uh, the the national videos uh, again were shot here in Maryland, and so lots of our folks were involved. Um, that video, also as well as the other two videos we're going to watch, are available on uh, the uh, Return to Activities page, uh, and uh, I think the links are also on the Coaches Resource page um, and such. But you'll be going through and asking four questions uh, of each person, and you need to ask them individually, not to a whole group at one time, as you saw going, and again, going through one at a time. Yeah, in the last 14 days, have you been sick? Have you had a fever in the last week? Cough or difficulty breathing? And then do you have any of the following uh, with the listing there? You may have noted that uh, uh, Jeff was holding a, a nice graphic uh, picture uh, printed out on, uh, on paper. Um, I, I've, at our recent competitions, I've been the one who's been doing the screenings. Uh, and um, th that was there 
Uh, and, um, and that was very helpful using that as a guide. Um, one thing to note with that, uh, those symptoms there, what we're looking for, what we're asking is whether uh, it, it's a, something that they're experiencing that is different. If they have a chronic condition such as asthma or I have a chronic sinus condition um, or, or other situations there, uh, then no, they can, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, you know can, like for example, in my situation, I, I chronically, I have congestion and runny nose. I can still answer this question as no, because it's not different from what I've, uh, I typically am experiencing there. So that's what that little box is there. Um, after they've answered all of those questions as no, and you've recorded, then you can go ahead uh, and actually do a temperature check. You may ask, have to have them remove their uh, a hat if they're wearing a baseball cap or a hat there so you can get to their forehead. Uh, and um, um, in most cases with those thermometers, you don't wanna touch, physically touch them with it, uh, but you do need to get relatively close. And as long as their temperature uh, is not 100.4 degrees or higher, um, they're good to go. Uh, what you can do is if you get one reading with that, um, at 100.4, you can let them rest for a little bit uh, or you, and, and then about five minutes later, recheck if there was a long walk from the parking lot and it's hot outside uh, or they were lugging a lot of materials in, you know, they have uh, things that they're bringing in. Because again, this applies not just to your athletes, but to all of your volunteers uh, and such. So if someone was bringing in a number of, uh, say, uh, bowling ramps uh, or whatever, um, you, know, you can give them a moment or two to cool down. Um, one note also, the folks that are doing the screening, they also need to be screening. So they should be the very first folks who get the screening there uh, as a part of that. Um, okay, so, and we'll talk through, we'll, we'll go through the, um, uh, the, the log and the forms again in just a moment. Uh, but Zach, why don't we pop up that, uh, that third poll uh, and uh, uh, see what we've got for folks. So again here, uh, read through each of them. I know it'll take a moment to read them, but check off the ones that are true, all of the statements that are true, uh, and then um, uh, again, submit, so. It's not letting me select more than one answer. Oh, really? Hmm, that's interesting. I'm the same way, only one answer. Okay, so, uh, hold on a sec. Do you want me to end it, Mike, and we can edit it quick? No, that's okay. I'm um, going to go ahead. Uh, I've unhid. That's why we have hidden slides. So... <laughs> So here's the question again. Um, so let's just go through. So uh, A here, uh, is that true? If a person answers at least three questions of the screening questions, no, uh, then they can proceed to the uh, next uh, stage of pre-screening. Um, you can just show using the yes, no buttons. Is that a yes or a no? Is that, or is that true? If it's true, um, putting yes on your... Uh, your um, what yes, you know, no buttons? Okay, under, under participants, if everybody clicks on participants on your toolbar, you will see all the people and then there's a yes, no check mark um, that you can select. Okay. So if that is true, put yes. And that if that is not true, put no. So at least three. Okay. It looks like we got for most folks. Okay, and that statement A is false. They need to be able to answer all four of those screening questions as no. Again, we have that caveat I mentioned of, you know, if it's a chronic condition, but they still need to be able to answer that as no. Okay, Zach, you wanna clear those? And then uh, the item B, that a person with a temperature of 100.4 or greater will be asked to wait five minutes to cool down before a recheck is allowed. Yes, if that's true, uh, no, if that's not true. Okay, and everyone's coming in. Yep, that one's absolutely true, way to go. Uh, C, only partners, uh, athletes and unified partners need to be screened. 
Way to go. No one's sleeping on, our, on this watch. Way to go. That, that is false. Uh, a no-touch thermometer should be used to measure temperatures. Okay, yep. And then E, we didn't talk about this, but um, uh, your thoughts. It's advisable to have the pre-screening area located near the parking area if possible. Okay, uh, and that is true. Uh, and the reason being is uh, in the unlikely event that uh, you have to have someone um, uh, it's someone who doesn't pass the screening, uh, they can go right back to their car uh, and, um, uh, and haven't really made contact with other folks. It may not always be possible. Uh, so again, it's that if possible uh, option that's there. Um, so great, okay. Um, any questions on the screening process um, that we talked about here? I haven't seen anything pop up so far, Mike. Great. Okay. Again, this isn't your only opportunity to ask questions. So, um, but uh, we'll we'll keep moving. So a little bit uh, uh, redundant here again. Oh, there's a typo in there. Um, uh, everyone, will, we're starting in phase one and then can move to uh, phase from phase one to phase two after a minimum of two weeks. That's going to be decided again on an area by area basis. And it's a decision that um, uh, headquarters, uh, typically through Jeff Abel uh, or um, a member of his uh, local program development team, they're taking the lead on this uh, uh, return to activity. Uh, they'll make that in conjunction with your area leadership. Um, need to follow the, not state, but state <laughs> and local guidelines, uh, local programs. Uh, again, they have to be, you have to basically be showing that you can go through the screening process and adhere to the guidelines uh, before moving from phase one to phase two. Um, I mentioned about the more restrictive and such there. Um, and again, as uh, I think that was uh, uh, Rob had asked the question, um, that, that applies across the board to all of your uh, activities within the area in general. Um, one of the things to note, uh, since there are several areas who are uh, maybe are starting uh, if or when they can start bowling, um, that may be the first spart, sport that they do. Um, uh, it, it's, as was mended, I think mentioned previously, uh, with phase one, it's really recommended to be doing stuff outdoors. We certainly would make an adjustment for that uh, for bowling. But again, that's all going to be around when your area leadership uh, sees it as ready to, to start and working in conjunction uh, with uh, the headquarters folks for that. Um, if there is a failed screening, again, as you saw there, uh, when uh, Nick Stort um, uh, answered no or answered yes to one of the questions, um, uh, he uh, asked to step off to the side. Uh, that again, there is one where you could um, have them just go back to their car uh, and uh, depart at that point. Uh, in some uh, areas, I think they're actually even trying to catch some folks uh, and doing the screening before people leave their cars. Uh, again, it depends upon what your facility and what's possible with that uh, to do. Um, if they uh, have uh, COVID symptoms um, uh, or so answered yes to those questions, they need to wait uh, seven days after they've been symptom free for seven days. So basically a total of uh, 14 days. I'm not sure why it's worded that way, <laughs> so, but that's the way that it's worded. Or they could have written uh, proof from a physician uh, that they do not have COVID and they're fine and can go forward. Um, uh, and then again, if they uh, have actually tested positive, not just had symptoms, but tested positive, then they do need to get that written medical clearance that they are um, uh, no longer uh, have COVID and are um, uh, non-infectious and such uh, that they can get from their physician for that. Mention about the acknowledgement of risk form. So this is a new uh, requirement that started with this return to activity. We are tracking it in GMS for those of you who are familiar with our, our computer program, uh, but it's something that needs to be read and signed by all participants uh, um, with their guardian signature if they are uh, a minor or do not have their own guardianship uh, with that. Um, it acknowledges that they understand that there are high-risk populations. Uh, they may be within a high-risk population, 
uh, and that there are risks associated with participating um, in um, these activities. It's also acknowledging uh, that there are certain behaviors that they need to uh, adhere to um, uh, in terms of both the no direct contact and staying six feet apart, so on down the line. Uh, and that it also acknowledges that they may be asked to leave if they can't adhere to these behaviors. Um, and I strongly re recommend, again, do this before your first practice. If you can have an online um, session with most of your folks and you can go through this with them, it really will make things a lot easier. Um, and again, it may be the case that not everyone uh, will be able to participate within these requirements, but it is uh, absolutely a requirement. Uh, we need one signed document for each and every participant. Uh, and then uh, working with your area leadership, these need to be submitted uh, to headquarters. Um, they need to come in within a week, uh, be actually at physically at Special Olympics Maryland within a week of their first activity. Uh, and again, we'll track all this in the database. If you have some participants, if you're in an area that's already had activity, um, they don't need to fill out a new form. Uh, it's one and done, it's, they're, they're good to go. Uh, the only exception, and I should say uh, at this point, there is no expiration date. We don't anticipate there being an expiration date or a need for them to renew it. The only exception to that is that if it is a minor who is completing the form, someone who is under the age of 18, they, they would need to renew it uh, when they become an adult because uh, when they're a minor, their parent or guardian is signing on their behalf. When they become 18, they can sign for themselves. Those dates and those expirations are also tracked in GMS and your area leadership have access to that information. Uh, this is what the first, um, or the two of the pages of the form looks like this. The one on the right-hand side is the one that they uh, fill out, uh, sign and return. Uh, note this is not a waiver. This is strictly an acknowledgement uh, that they understand that there are risks involved. You can read through all the statements that are here. Again, these are all in that guide. There's also links on the, um, the coach resource page on the main coach, coach resource page, not the one specific to bowling, but on the main one, there's links so that you can download this form if you don't have a copy um, uh, handy and so on down the line. Uh, and uh, read through and again, you can see all the different acknowledgements that are there. I'm not gonna read through them to you. Uh, now you can do that at your own. Uh, and again, you have that access uh, and such. Uh, there is a third page, actually, I think it's the actual, turns out to be the actual first page of it, um, that, excuse me, uh, that covers high risk individuals and describes that, um, that there is a higher risk uh, for some individuals to participate, a higher risk that they could get, uh, contract COVID, uh, and if they did, that they could have more significant challenges uh, within there, uh, as has been in the news recently with um, uh, both age, um, being overweight, so on down the line. Uh, also note that um, uh, it does apply, a high risk uh, situation uh, applies to folks who live in a group home. I think it's because of the multiple people being, uh, being there. So we're not saying that a person who is in a high risk category cannot participate. We are not saying that at all. Um, what we are saying is they need to be sure by completing this acknowledgement of risk form that, they, um, that there is this higher risk of having uh, additional challenges um, uh, and, um, uh, and such that's there. Uh, that's, that, that, again, that's all listed there. This again, this needs to be completed before the individual participates uh, and strongly recommend doing that ahead of time uh, before anybody shows up at your first practice. In addition, there's a practice log. This needs to be completed at each practice session. And it, it actually, basically, it needs to be completed at each activity. So if you are having some type of an in-person meeting, we don't recommend that right now. But if you are, uh, or if there was a fundraiser, as an example, um, I believe Carroll County, uh, has had a, um, uh, a couple fundraisers recently. Everybody who's participating there needs to be screened and this is the log that you use. Do not make up your own log. Um, uh, but the, the form is available and but what you can do is make up one and then photocopy it, um, uh, leaving of course the screened and sign, whether they've been screened and whether they have um, 
uh, the symptoms and whether uh, there's a column for their um, uh, for their temperature. You leave those blank because those you'll fill you'll fill out at each practice session. Um, but uh, having the contact information, why do you have the contact information there? If after this, after your practice, it turns out that um, you know someone had been uh, did have COVID, um, you want to be able to have very quickly, very easily the ability to get back with someone uh, and let folks know of the situation. We have had I won't mention the area. We have had one area where uh, a coach um, uh, had COVID. Uh, it was found out after one of their practices. Uh, by every indication, uh, it did not. Um, spread to anybody else, uh, then they've actually, they've gone through uh, the uh, a couple weeks, the, the 14 day um, waiting period, and they've restarted their program uh, for that particular sport. Um, uh, but again, all needs to be completed. Uh, this also, this form needs to be scanned and sent in to headquarters within one week. We need to receive it within a week of each of your practice sessions. And again, work with your area personnel to make sure that um, uh, you uh, have this completed. And if you have any questions, that's associated with that. And again, the link there to the coach resource page uh, to download it. Not gonna go over much on this. Uh, we did have an extension uh, for medicals for folks whose medicals had expired between uh, mid-March when this all started up uh, and the end of September. That's all been done. Um, they were all updated, but it's past now the date by which we um, uh, extended them. We are not, th that was a one-time only situation. We will not be doing that again. Uh, we need to get special dispensation from SOI in order to do that extension. So that doesn't apply to anybody else um, going forward. Uh, but in case you heard about it, we didn't want to not mention it. Okay, so let's watch another video here. Preparing the venue to safely welcome Special Olympics participants is vital for return to activity for Phases 1 and 2. Arrive early to prepare the space. Start by ensuring the venue is disinfected or sanitized, especially the bathrooms and other high-touch areas. Wear disposable gloves for all tasks in the cleaning process, including the handling of trash. After sanitizing the space, set up signage that reinforces proper hygiene procedures, physical distancing, and wearing personal protective equipment, or PPE. Post signs in easy to understand language with visual cues in highly visible locations, like entrances and restrooms. The signs should describe how to stop the spread of germs by properly washing hands, following physical distancing guidelines, and explaining how to properly wear a cloth face covering. Also, make sure hand sanitizer and or hand washing facilities or stations are available. Lastly, set up a single entry with screening and a single exit area, which means there should be one entrance into the venue and one exit out of the venue that allows participants to be at least two meters or six feet apart. For more information on Special Olympics Return to Activity Protocol and Safety Guidelines, visit resources.specialolympics.org or consult your local program. Uh, and one note, uh, some folks may have noticed that there was, uh, it was actually an aide who was there with an athlete uh, and was within six feet. He's actually uh, with uh, Dan Tuchelski, he's his aide. Um, uh, they certainly were not separated by six feet. That's okay. They basically reside together. Um, and so uh, the, there are, you know, that kind of exception um, uh, that we have with folks. But uh, since they live together uh, and um, um, are in that situation, uh, that's permitted. So PPE uh, and other equipment, um, again, have these on pra uh, at practice. Uh, work with your area leadership to make sure you have all of these. Um, masks, thermometers, hand sanitizer, so on down the line. Yes, we are saying that people should bring their own masks. Um, and so we are not suggesting you have enough masks there to have everyone wear uh, or provide one to everyone who's there. However, things can happen. Uh, a mask could get dirty, a string could break, any of a number of things could happen. I mean, in theory, someone could forget it, forget to bring theirs, one would hope that wouldn't happen. Um, but, uh, and I should say again, at the competitions that we've held, we've had three so far, 
Um, can't speak to individual practices, but so far everyone has brought their masks. There hasn't been an issue with any of that uh, to date. Um, so again, we've provided to each area two thermometers uh, and gloves, and we have available the other materials uh, that we can provide where the area can purchase through us. They don't have to purchase through us, but that's there. Again, work with the area directors uh, and they'll get uh, the materials out to you. Please, individual coaches, do not contact headquarters. We're going to refer you to your area director because he or she, uh, or in some cases them, uh, will have uh, the information on, um, on accessing that and uh, they may have the stockpile there available for you. Not going to read through this again uh, in detail. You can, you please do, again, everything that we've got here is in that packet uh, that Zach will forward to you. Um, but the gist of it in terms of fast masks and face coverings, um, Everyone needs to wear one. And with a couple exceptions, I'll note in a moment, everyone needs to be wearing one throughout the entire time. The couple exceptions that are, that are possible are uh, for outdoor activities, um, athletes and unified partners, once they begin participating in the physical sport, uh, or actually basically when they start their, their, um, their stretching and their, their warm ups and such, they can remove their mask uh, at that point, the athletes and the unifies partners. When they're not engaged in that activity, they need to have it on, but when they are actively engaged, they can take them off. Do not go around and collect all of them because again, you'll have the indirect contact situation and um, you know, have them put them in their pocket. Um, they can put them in a little Ziploc bag, so on down the line. Um, but uh, when they're actually participating, they do not need to wear them. However, and this is one of the things that'll come through in the, um, the final version of the bowling specific protocols, because bowling is an indoor activity and because folks are to some degree going to be a little closer physically, they should still be six feet apart, but they're not gonna be quite as spread out. There's not as much air circulation in there. Um, they would need to, at this time, we're expecting that uh, all, um, uh, individuals, including athletes and partners, need to wear their face covering at all time. So uh, again, we're sharing you, with you the standards, uh, and then this is one um, uh, bowling specific that we expect to be part of that protocol. So just want to give you that little heads up. There will be some other things. We'll touch on a couple of the things in a moment. Coaches and, and other volunteers should be wearing their masks throughout. Um, uh, if the coach is, um, and this really wouldn't apply to bowling because again, you're indoors, they should be wearing it throughout. But uh, if they're engaged in the physical activity where they're becoming a participant for a particular drill or whatever, they could remove it at that point. But otherwise they do need to wear it. That also means when we're saying non-sport volunteers, all of your folks who are doing your screenings are wearing their masks throughout that entire time. Basically anybody who's helping anybody who's in that vicinity needs to be wearing their mask throughout. Only when you're outdoor and can remove uh, and are in physical activity could the athletes or partners uh, remove them. Um, and again, we'll have some specifics that will come with that uh, shortly. So let's give this a shot. As a coach, you have a critical role in ensuring the safety of your participants. It is necessary to adapt some of your coaching strategies to lead safe practices under Special Olympics' new return to activity guidelines. Before each activity, communicate the need for high-risk individuals to participate at home. And have all participants complete the COVID-19 Participant Code of Conduct and Risk Assessment forms. Forms may be tracked in GMS if the program would like. During practice, it is important to maintain physical distancing of at least six feet or two meters between all participants. To do this, place markers on the ground to indicate what six feet is and have extra volunteers to remind participants to maintain their distance. We know it is difficult, but to ensure the safety of everyone participating, there are no fist bumps, high fives, hugs, or huddles right now during this COVID-19 pandemic. You can still support your friends and teammates by cheering each other on. 
All participants should come to the activity with their own supplies and cannot share masks, water bottles, towels, or uniforms. In Phase 2, the use of shared equipment is allowed but should be limited. All equipment will be disinfected between each use. Wear face masks throughout activities, including arrivals and departures. Do not touch the outside of the mask. Do not scratch or touch your face. Masks do not need to be worn during active exercise. However, if sneezing, coughing, or yawning without a face mask on, participants should cover their faces with a tissue or elbow, not their hands, and throw away any tissues and wash their hands immediately. Throughout the activity, use verbal and visual signs to remind participants about hygiene, standard infection prevention, physical distancing, and use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. For more information on Special Olympics Return to Activity Protocol and Safety Guidelines, visit resources.specialolympics.org or consult your local program. So um, one note with that also, uh, and an observation from uh, competitions that I think carry over to um, training programs as well. So um, the, the, the idea of having those poly spots or in some other way marking where people should be, uh, it can't be um, overemphasized. One of the things that we noticed this past Saturday, we were doing the football skills uh, event. Uh, while people were very observant initially on staying six feet apart and that type of thing, as the activity went on, um, uh, some folks, some athletes, some volunteers uh, started to forget that and they needed to be reminded. So having a visual cue, whether again, a poly spot or with bowling, uh, bring some blue painter's tape um, you know, and mark where people can sit or where people can't sit uh, to, um, to designate uh, where they can go. That can serve as a nice reminder and we will be adding that again to our, um, uh, our um, uh, activities as well uh, to, to keep that in mind. Um, mentioned before about the three, the, some of the training resources, the three interactive webinars are available. And again, they're all uh, available through that, um, that uh, return to play and you'll have them with the slides that are here. Um, SOI, and then also there's weekly posts in the social media uh, uh, channel for Special Olympics Maryland. Again, all available through uh, our Facebook page and our website that you can access there. Um, uh, SOI, Special Olympics International, is working with the national governing bodies for additional sports-specific resources. Some are available now, have been posted. Uh, it really varies by sport. Uh, with that, uh, and we'll certainly incorporate those uh, resources as we have them available and push them out to you. Uh, and then also for volunteers, uh, there is a general orientation that Special Olympics Maryland is doing specifically to uh, COVID training. I think the next one actually, I just heard this morning uh, that Sam Boyd, who is our Director of Volunteers, is going to do another one next week. So if you have volunteers that you anticipate uh, helping out with your screening, uh, and such, maybe they aren't actually helping coaching um, uh, your athletes, but may help in that capacity. There's a training opportunity for that um, and uh, for those resources as well. So I mentioned before uh, that the bowling protocol are coming out. Uh, they're still being developed uh, and finalized. I think they're, at this point, uh, they're in the process of being vetted for, uh, for input um, or for final input on such. But a couple things, so uh, we have started uh, a small pilot program in Garrett County. Garrett County uh, has actually been uh, uh, following, the, there are, there's a, a map that we use from Harvard uh, that uh, rates each county uh, in the country. We obviously are just looking at Maryland. Uh, and Garrett County has been in the green, if you will, um, the, the most positive in terms of, um, uh, in the best situation. And so we went ahead and tried some, uh, some piloting that's going on there to see how best uh, these uh, protocols can apply uh, and are waiting, I think, for at least another practice session and then we'll be um, incorporating them in. So, but from all indications, things are going well with that. As we're waiting for that, a couple things that you can do right now um, is start making, con if you haven't already done so, 
make contacts with your bowling facilities uh, just to kind of see what their scheduling process is. Uh, I know, for example, we have a lot of association uh, with uh, the uh, Gaithersburg uh, Bowl America um, that uh, and they have certain restrictions there. Find out what their protocols are uh, because you'll need to factor them into your uh, plans and such. If they're only letting a certain number of people in uh, or certain reservations or such, you need to know what that is ahead of time and factor that in. Uh, it can also be helpful, um, again, being an indoor facility uh, before you start and before your area director will give the go-ahead uh, or will be given the go-ahead. Uh, we likely will want to see what your uh, facility looks like, so uh, contact them. Uh, and uh, if you can get a floor plan that's dynamite or take some pictures, uh, you can just take them on your phone uh, and have them available um, should you need them that's there. Uh, some, when we talk about the uh, bowling specific protocol, uh, some things that are being looked at with that uh, is the, do we need to adjust that group size? Uh, we have the 10 and we have the 50. Uh, there's a big jump between 10 and 50 um, and uh, whether that needs to be uh, tweaked. And again, some of the other components that are in there, uh, once they're final, we absolutely will get them out to you. And again, we anticipate that in the relatively near future um, uh, and such. Okay. Um, so um, any questions so far? Um, I will say Pam had a question that she sent uh, privately, which is a, a very good question. Sure. Um, at, uh, she asked, uh, where do athletes sit to stay apart? Um, and so that's also going to depend on your venue, like Mike was saying. Depending on how your venue layout is, some bowling CD areas have two chairs there, some have three, some are big and have four. Um, you know, if you have three or four seats, you may be able to sit an athlete every other seat and stagger uh, from across one another on, on a lane. So you can get potentially three athletes on a lane. Um, but if your venue has two chairs on each side of the lane, it may be one athlete sitting on each side of the lane, and it may be two athletes participating on that lane. Um, part of that will be covered in the bowling portion uh, of the bowling protocol portion of the return to activities guide. Um, and again, when, when you start talking to your facility, a lot of the facilities have kind of a, a game plan, and you can get their sense of, of what they think is good in the first place, too. Uh, but we do have recommendations for that. And it, again, it will vary facility to facility. Right. Okay. Um, what that also may mean too, and I realize that having previously run a bowling program uh, for Special Olympics, um, uh, it may mean that uh, parents or others may need to stay out of the facility after they come and uh, the athlete checks in, they may go back, have to go back and wait in their car um, you know, depending upon the spacing that you've got, if they can't maintain that. So all sorts of things that apply. Um, so what I would like to do, if we could, is um, kind of open up for, uh, and, and let's do this using the chat, if you could type in um, uh, for this, uh, the, uh, what do you think are some of the implications of the requirements for social distancing that would apply to your program? Um, what might that mean? Um, and I'm looking at your question, Pat. Uh, uh Pat, uh, so uh, while you're typing, uh, while other folks, again, just type your, your thoughts into them and do this to everyone. Don't do it just to Zach. Um, but uh, type in your thoughts on what some implications might be. Pat, in answer to your question, uh, uh, can we get the slides and such? Uh, I would think so. I think they're already there, but if they're not, um, uh, we certainly can do that. And I'll make a note to uh, make sure we can get that to you. Or we wouldn't necessarily get it to you, but we'd have them posted available on the coach resource pages. So what are some thoughts there? Okay. Um, Zach, if you couldn't. Um... Yeah, so, so one of the ones that came in is uh, number of athletes that can participate based on phase and venue. Uh, I think that's a perfect example, like we just talked through with the chairs. Um, your venue may dictate how many athletes you can start with. Um, and again, it, it doesn't hurt to start small and kind of grow from there. Um, it may affect which athletes can participate, like Mike was saying, you know, need to be able to follow the, the social distancing and understand that concept. 
uh, which can be really hard at times. You know, you want to give high fives and, and hugs and stuff like that. Um, but again, they need to adhere to that. Um, depending on what phase you're in, that's, that's another good one. Um, uh, and that's all we have so far. But again, you know, um, like we've been mentioning with bowling, I think facility, facility tends to play a, a bigger role than a lot of outdoor sports. Again, indoor facilities and sports have finite space at the end of the day. And here are just some suggestions or some, some pointers. Again, it's not uh, exhaustive. The key thing with this is be thinking through. Uh, and one of the things that we've offered for um, uh, a couple of the other sports and uh, have had some success with that, Zach, um, I'll, uh, I'm sure you would, you would uh, agree. Uh, if there's a value to it, we certainly can have uh, a couple additional sessions for specifically for bowling coaches, which are just uh, kind of open sharing sessions of, um, you know, just, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll put some structure to them so it's not free for all. Uh, but where those coaches who wish to come to a, a, a 30 minute web session to just discuss how things are going, what problems they're having, what solutions others have gotten, uh, that's certainly something that we could do. Um, so um, with the same question again, toss into your, the chat there. Uh, so we talked about social distancing, but what are some of the implications for the requirement of no indirect or direct contact uh, when you're starting out uh, in phase one? And while we're, we're waiting for those to come in, um, uh, oh, a good one already came in, helping ramp bowlers. Um, you know, there's, there's potentially going to be a limit there. Um, the, one, the one caveat to that, and Mike, I think you might have been getting ready to, to mention this, is if they're from the same household, right. um, they're, they're eligible to work together um, because they, they're from the same household at that point, um, and they've signed the acknowledgement of risk. Um, so for ramp bowlers, there is a little bit of flexibility if they're, they're – parent, their um, caregiver, whomever it may be, also lives with them um, and obviously has all their registered paperwork in to be a, a Class A volunteer for Special Olympics. Okay. Um, another quick one that I'll give while we're waiting for one or two more to come in, um, and I'll steal this one from Rich Domros, is Rich, Rich likes to teach a, a technique about teaching an athlete how to walk through the four-step approach when delivering the ball, and he likes to go hand-in-hand -hand and walk through the approach with them. So indirect contact, I mean, not only is, can you not do it with indirect contact, but now you can't do it with direct contact. So now you got to figure out how to coach that four-step approach without walking them through it, without, you know, touching them or touching the ball at that point as well. Mm -hmm. Good points. Uh... Um, another, uh, another good question uh, that came in uh, from Baltimore County. Baltimore County does have a large group like, um, Montgomery and Howard County. And um, the question was essentially, have, is having two sessions possible? And that's totally possible. If, if your venue has the, the space and time to accommodate you guys within the protocol, you're more than welcome to have more than one session. Um, I do know that Howard County and uh, Montgomery County, because they are such big programs, they offer typically a fall competition um, bowling group and they also offer a spring group um so i mean with all those bowlers they're definitely in that mindset too so baltimore county can definitely do that um contact and again, that's the where you can work with your your area leadership and the facility to, to see what's possible yeah yeah contact at the ball return is a big one for indirect contact right you know if you have an athlete that's used to not picking up their own ball or getting some assistance with that that's something that they need to be able to do in phase one with indirect contact. Um, because again, one person cannot touch a bowling ball and then another person can touch it unless it's sanitized in between those two people. Right. So I think one other thing to note with this, um, and this may have occurred to folks already, um, it is likely with this entire package that you may not be able to accommodate the number of bowlers that you've had before. In most cases, I would think, unless you had a very small bowling program initially, uh, that may be the case. Um, and I can tell you right now that uh, for virtually every other sport that has started back up, every, almost every program is also similarly putting some type of limit on that. Uh, it may also be the case that you need to limit this 
to your experienced bowlers. I'm not advocating that, but it's something you need to potentially consider. For some sports, uh, given the no direct contact uh, and the, the social distancing and such, you, it may just be impossible to train someone who's never done a particular sport how to do that in these current situations. I can only imagine, uh, it's not swimming season yet, but um, you know, someone who's never swam before, I, I can't see how there's any way that you could do uh, that with these, uh, with these protocols that would still be in place very likely at that time. So those are judgment calls and decisions that you should make in conjunction with your area leaders. Keep in mind, your area leaders have been working through this and have been an integral part of, uh, of this entire process uh, since, um, uh, uh, I I'd like to say since the whole situation began, but at least since July. Uh, and so have been thinking through what possibilities there might be. Uh, and so certainly um, talk through with them uh, and, uh, and see what's what. Uh, we certainly don't want to play favorites. We want to be as fair as possible to every athlete, but we also want to be as safe as we can with every athlete while still, if possible, offering a training program. So um, uh, yeah, Jill, I see we need to be careful how we select. You're absolutely right. Uh, and in many cases, area leaders have already gone through and given some thought to that. In some cases, some areas have said, uh, again, they're not open, whether the person has experience in the sport or not, they're not open to um, uh, any new athletes at this point in time uh, for any kind of in-person activity. Uh, it could also be that um, in some cases, um, you know, the, uh, they need to be at a certain level of the, or that, uh, uh, where the events that are being offered, I'm not sure how much that would apply to bowling, but um, uh, you know, if you, uh, again, just talk through with your areas and folks with that. Um, and Pat, yet uh, due to capacity limitations, parents and caregivers, class A, absolutely, yes. Anybody who uh, is stepping up and, and working with your, with your program does need to be a class A volunteer. Uh, so they have to have their screening done and such. They also have to have their protective behaviors done. Uh, and again, work with your area leaders there. They can get you up-to-date lists on um, uh, of, of who has what. Uh, one more, sorry, I have to click over here. Um, and then just um, giving some thought to teaching, I think Zach actually touched on this about how would you do these kind of things um, uh, in terms of teaching these types of things. And again, it may limit who you can have participating at this point in time. We certainly hope that this, this temporary situation gets resolved as soon as possible, but realistically, uh, we're gonna be in this for several more months, even in the best case uh, scenario. Uh, several more months, uh, and um, uh, you know we need to do the best that we can. This also gives you some opportunity, Zach. I think we'll touch on it later um, uh, of uh, some virtual training and opportunities. And we, I'm not sure if the bowling one. I think it's in final edits, but a virtual training guide is being produced um, so that for those athletes who maybe can't participate in person, uh, there's some options for that. But I don't want to steal your thunder with that. Um, so, so really quick, uh, Pam asked a question. Spectators have to wear a mask. If they're going to be in the bowling alley, they, they got to wear masks. If it's a sport where it's soccer and parents are standing at the edge of the parking lot, 50 yards away on the other side of the park, you know, that's, that's kind of a choice for them. But with bowling, when you're in the venue, everybody's so tight. Um, that's something that, that they do need to do. Um, and a clarification for Trisha Hahn. Um, when you were asking about uh, Class A volunteers, uh, anybody that's coming inside, uh, if they're not participating directly with your program, facilitating bowling training in some way, if they're not helping facilitate bowling training in some way or doing the screening, they don't need to be Class A cleared if they're just parents that are inside spectating, but they do need to wear a mask. Right. Uh, so, and, and also uh, with Pam's point, um, I can pretty much guarantee, I can't imagine any bowling facility uh, that is not going to require everybody in the building to be wearing a mask at this point in time. So, um, uh, and I'm sure that they'll be monitoring that, but, uh, uh, but yeah, absolutely for spectators in there. Um, so, uh, and then Anthony's uh, anticipated start date. Uh, again, that's something we, we'll need to work out individually with your area. Um, and uh, when they're ready, in some cases, 
Uh, like I had mentioned before, some areas haven't started anything at this point. Some others uh, have gone through and uh, are more comfortable in the situation. A lot of it's going to depend upon your facilities as well. So unfortunately, I can't give you an, a, a definitive answer right now. I would say that the earliest, other than the one pilot program we have going with Garrett uh, at the moment, uh, it's very small. Uh, the earliest would be once we have the protocols for the indoor bowling specific uh, adjustments available, which should be within the next week or two. Um, uh, so once that's out, in theory, um, a program could start up. But again, it's something you'll need to work through with your area leaders. Uh, and I, I'm assuming everyone knows who their area director is or who their area leaders are uh, and um, I can work through with them uh, about getting started. So. Um, uh, and then Dave, uh, our spectators part of the participant count. Um, as Zach was saying, for any outdoor sport, they might not be. I got to say, for bowling, just given the layout of any facility that I've seen, they, I can't see how they could get far enough away and be a spectator and not be part of that count. Um, again, there might be a facility that's, that's laid out differently. Um, but... Uh, you know, and, and so there might be some unique situation, but I think for bowling, yeah, they're going to be countered. And I think that's something that'll be included uh, in those protocol or the, the things specific to bowling that are coming around. Um, so, uh, Zach, I tell you what, why don't I think at this point, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. And uh, you'll take over and I'll be watching for questions and such there. So and I'm going to go ahead and mute myself at Oh, it took me all the way back. We're not starting from the beginning, I promise. Um, we will not go through all that a second time. Mike did a wonderful job rolling us through that. Um, I would like to play from this current slide though. All right, so we are gonna hit some, some bowling uh, specific stuff now. A lot of this stuff you guys have seen before, so we are gonna breeze through this relatively quickly, uh, but just some points that we wanna reiterate for bowling specifically. Again, uh, we, we say this every year, but again, no, no athlete or volunteer can participate in any manner without having a uh, valid and current medical or their volunteer application um, and protective behaviors completed. Um, again, that's, that's for every year. That's never going to change for us. So while we don't have our traditional competition deadlines that you guys need to prepare for and have stuff in by, um, we still are tracking and trying to record all of our participants for virtual and in-person training. Um, so the date that we have right now is 11-1. We would like all of that in. Again, that date may shift a little bit depending on when that uh, protocol comes out. Um, so, but as of right now, try to have your participants submitted in for uh, recording in training in GMS by 11-1. Um, we will give you a heads up if that date changes in any way. Uh, again, what is required for each participant? Again, athletes need their medical form and their acknowledgement of risk form. Um, but then from there, when it comes to general volunteers, sport volunteers, assistant, assistant coaches, head coaches, it's essentially all the same requirements we ask for every single year, but with the addition of that acknowledgement of risk form. Um, again, just a reminder, like Mike said, that acknowledgement of risk is a one and done form. Uh, so if you have somebody that hasn't participated in person this year, they will have to do it once if they've participated with another sport that your program offers. Um, they won't have to do that, but again, work with your area leadership to know who has potentially put, participated with another sport prior to coming to bowling. Bowling events, are, we're offering the same events as usual. Um, singles, traditional doubles, unified doubles, that has not changed up to this point. Um, so again, for your athletes to be training, more than likely what it comes down to for this year is that you will probably have most of your athletes training in singles. Um, there could be a special situation like the ramp bowling where they may be training in traditional doubles or unified doubles if they're from the same household. Um, again, that's, that's kind of the, the uh, stipulation to doubles this year is if they are from the same household they can participate in that manner. Otherwise, most of your athletes are probably participating in a singles type of uh, training this year. Rules reminders, we're not gonna read through this. Um, the handicap is 100% of 200. Uh, again, that's a reminder. I know some people struggle with the handicap, especially at competition. They see the, the score up on the board. 
um, and forget that we do handicap bowling. So it's always good to remind your bowlers and your parents about the handicap that we use. Number of games hasn't changed. Still will uh, bowl three games for competition. Um, so if you can get that much training time with your facility for this year for in-person too, I would stick to that as well. This year, um, USBC specifically, uh, US Bowling Congress is not requiring alternating lanes for their competitions that they are having. Um, so this year, we're not gonna ask you to worry about that. Um, if for some reason you have a really good venue where you can spread out across the whole venue and you can work with your athletes and remind them of that, that's great. But again, it's not required this year. Um, we're trying to keep the alternating lanes at a very minimum state and following USBC's uh, ruling with that. Fouls, fouls are still the same thing with the foul line violations. Bumper, uh, again, if you have an athlete that use, utilizes bumpers, that's not eligible for competition. Uh, there's no bumpers in competition. Um, and then lane courtesy, uh, that's something good to be teaching your bowlers uh, every year. Uh, again, you know, uh, one of the things that I think people get hung up on, and I think Rich and, and Rob can definitely attest to this from some conversations and some videos that we've checked out and stuff too, is people struggle to recognize when to bowl that spare. Um, you know, some people like to take their time. Some people like to roll right through it. Again, work with your athletes, talk to them. Um, and if you have questions on those type of things, feel free to reach out to myself. Um, and, you know, Rich, Rich and Rob are always my kind of go-to guys for rules as well too. So I'm sure they're willing to help as well. Um, alternates, we're not gonna talk about, not a, a competition type of thing that we need to go through. Um, you guys know the deal with coaching and being not permitted in the bowling area, um, but athletes can come up to, during competition, can come up to uh, the upper area off of the approach and the seating area for coaching. Um, again, this year, the biggest thing for coaching is, is remembering that, that six feet, two meter rule for social distancing. Um, there's going to be some things that are tricky that you got to figure out and kind of work through. Um, one good example is when talking to your athletes about what arrow you want them uh, focusing on and, and using for, for bowling and, and getting their accuracy up. One idea that somebody came up with in our virtual coaches training that we had recently was use a, um, a laser pointer and point to it on the lane. Um, so some coaches are, are comfortable and their facilities comfortable with letting them walk down and straddle the lane a little bit, you know, standing on the ball return. That's an option too, um, but those are the kind of things coaching wise you're gonna have to think through this year. Um, we talked about ramp bowling. Ramp bowling uh, has that stipulation of it can occur this year with participants if their assistant is from the same household. Um, but I will also remind everyone, because this is we, we put this in last year, I believe, that coming to competition, the ramp assistant uh, must be the same person that they are uh, the ramp assistant for all year long needs to come to the competition and be the same ramp assistant on site. It needs to be a uh, class A volunteer from your program. Um, we've had issues in the past where uh, people have thought it can be a, a day of volunteer um, and that's not a good experience for your athlete. But the most important thing to remember around ramp bowling this year is that the ramp assistant must be from the same household uh, for COVID-19 purposes. Um, again, just additional stuff on ramp bowling assistance for the rules and stuff. Um, appropriate attire. Um, you guys set the standard for appropriate attire at your practices and training sessions. Um, so continue to do that. Um, I don't know if you ask you know, participants to wear the collared shirts and khaki pants at practice just to set that tone. It never hurts. Uh, but I know that can be a little difficult at times. Again, competition though, uh, if we were having competition this year, when we have competition next year, again, it's the khaki pants um, and it is the collared shirt. Um, again, no headwear is permitted. Um, I do need to make a tweak to this slide. Last year, starting the season, headphones were not permitted. Uh, the bowling SMT did submit and had approved a new rule change for headphones that headphones are allowed if a medical note is submitted to our headquarters office prior to competition. Um, and the type of headphones that are allowed are the, the headphones that you see people that are doing uh, landscaping work, you know, riding the big lawn mowers, uh, or the folks that, you know, go out to the gun range, the, the, uh, the over the ear headphones that are not noise canceling. Um, they're not set up to play any sort of music through them. They are literally just headphones to stop 
all the noise from coming in. Very, very basic. So we will make that update to the slide before we send this out. Um, again, slacks, pants, uniform inspection before competition. And that's, that's it for the bowling specific stuff. Again, you guys have seen a lot of that stuff. Um, it's stuff that you are used to year in and year out, but we wanted to throw a few reminders in there. Um, again, the, the caveats to this year are ramp bowling and doubles bowling um, that, you know, most of your athletes are probably bowling singles style at this point, unless they're bowling with somebody uh, that's a um, either another athlete from their household or they are unified bowling with a um, class A cleared volunteer that's also from their household. Um, so Mike, unless you have anything to add, or I will also throw it out to Rich and Rob, if there's anything bowling specific you guys would like to add, um, we will take some questions here because I've seen chat pop up with a few as well. Um, so yeah, uh, Tasha uh, was asking about uh, unassisted ramp bowlers. And uh, no, none of this implies that they now need to have an assistant. If they're unassisted, they set the ramp, excuse me, they set the ramp themselves. Uh, that's not something you need to be concerned with. Yep. Yep. That's, that's a very good question though. And Zach, your comment about khaki pants. Mm -hmm. Khaki is a color. They do not have to be khaki in <laughs> color. They must be yes. a Docker style or a dress style slack. Any color is permissible. Yes. Yes. Khaki, that is a good reminder. We, we need to make up t-shirts that say khaki is a color and distribute it to everyone <laughs> so, so we can enjoy those t-shirts one day. Um, Rich, is there anything that you want to toss in there that, that we kind of blew through bowling specific wise? I think you guys did a good job of covering everything tonight. Cool. Okay. Um, Mike, have you seen any other questions come in as far as chat? I haven't seen any hands raised um, in participants. Uh, no, the only one uh, once we uh, switched over for your portion was uh, the one from Tasha, unless anybody sent something to you directly. I, I have not seen anything okay. directly. Let me do a quick double check. Okay. Oh, and while you're doing that, I hope everyone's familiar with the coach resource page that Tex got up there. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about COVID and so on, and that's the address for the one specifically for bowling. There's a lot of general resources as well. There's links to the Special Olympics Bowling Coaches Guide, which is an excellent resource. I hope everyone's taking advantage of that uh, um, throughout your coaching career. So, and, and additionally, as Mike mentioned, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of a, a plug for it here, um, the Bowling Virtual Training Guide will also be found on the coach resource page. Uh, we're hoping to have that out and available to you guys by the end of the week. And essentially what that is, is it's an eight to 10 week uh, training program where you can start from week one and every week have a, a different um, uh, topic that you guys are gonna cover. Um, it also covers health and wellness through our Fit5 program. Um, so it has a lot of good content. So if, if you have a program where you know, maybe you have a really big program, um, which I know, uh, again, I'll, I'll go back to Rich here with Montgomery County. Montgomery Pro County has a huge program. The likelihood that they're going to be able to have everybody in person if they go in person um, is probably not likely. So, you know, that could be an alternate option. And Montgomery County has been actually running a lot of virtual um, training program stuff with their bowling athletes already up to this point. So um, if you have any virtual uh, questions, I, Montgomery County, Rich Domros, uh, Trisha Hahn, uh, they've been doing an excellent job with that as well. Uh, but that bowling virtual training guide should be out the end of this week for you guys. Um, additionally, we are not going to run through these slides. You guys have seen it, um, but I will just click through them really quickly. Essentially, again, work with your area leadership, coach requirements, protective behaviors, concussion, all those certifications, this beautiful chart that you've seen with um, what volunteers need to be certified at what levels. Um, I will also do another quick plug for our additional trainings that Mike Sarnowski has been running uh, and I've helped with and some of the other sports directors as well for um, coaching Special Olympics athletes. We've been doing virtual trainings and we've also been doing uh, principles of coaching trainings. Mike, when is that next uh, principles of coaching training again in November? 
uh, the next principles okay. of coaching is a split uh, on, I believe it's October 27th and 29th. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, we've decided to try that uh, in two evenings. It's a five hour uh, virtual course. Uh, and so we're gonna give that a try there. Uh, the next coaching Special Olympics athletes virtual session is uh, Sunday, November 15th. Perfect. Um, I, again, I wanted to plug those in there for people that are interested in attending those. Um, did have a, a question come in from Dave. If you have check-in separated from your bowling area, will these people not count to your number? Um, so we've been talking about uh, bowling check-in and we, I mean, if the weather's nice, the best case scenario is do it outside, right? You know, you know, catch people before they even walk into the building. And if that's the situation at that point, I don't think they count towards your number because you'll be so far apart and you'll be separated by walls at that point, which is also a, a very good <laughs> separating device. Um, but so yes, if your check-in area is that separate or if you're checking in participants at their vehicles, that will not count towards your number. Again, with bowling, it just gets really tricky the second you walk into the facility and get towards where your lanes uh, are assigned by the facility. Um, again, plowing through these slides here, uh, coach sports certification, we did have our virtual uh, uh, coaches bowling training. Um, you can still go on to USBC and, and get a certification through them uh, for certification for SONA sports training as well. Code of conduct for coaches. Um, you guys have seen this. Again, you can read through it on the slides. It's good to have. Um, athlete medicals remind you what it looks like. Uh, then after you get through the athlete medical, um, they talk about the, the volunteers and all the things that the volunteers get, need again. Shows you the volunteer application form. Uh, the minor application form, again, if you have a volunteer that's a minor, uh, they don't do the background check, they do the minor reference form. Um, incident reports, they're always good to have on site, uh, you know, not just now, but always good to have in your little toolkit that you bring to practice with you. This is what the incident report looks like. Um, and I like to remind people too that incident report isn't just needed for scraped knees or whatever. Um, I will say, in my years of experience with uh, Special Olympics for multiple programs, I have had to fill out one or two of these for U-Haul trucks that we've miraculously peeled the tops off of running into low roofs and stuff like that. Um, so, so again, it's not just for scraped knees, it's for incidents across the board. Um, and then Mike, do you wanna explain this human kinetics uh, slide for additional training options real quick? Um, sure, uh, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but yep. the the, the Basically, there are online training opportunities that we can, um, uh, uh, if a coach completes the course and submits uh, documentation that they both completed the course uh, and proof of payment that we will reimburse up to $20. And in some cases, the areas will reimburse as well. So there's some detail that's on there. These are the ones that, that are currently available all through Human Kinetics. We're looking to add some more to it. But um, um, yeah, I'm not sure if even there's one there for uh, bowling through that program. There's some general ones though down at the bottom that uh, that work for that too. Yep, um, and a question came in from Pam. Was there a specific training for COVID-19? Um, this is kind of the sports relative training for COVID-19 and the preparation for hosting an on-site um, training session or event. Um, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the trainings that Sam has been doing from the volunteer and program end has kind of been a general um, COVID training that has correct. been offered. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the volunteer training that I mentioned that she's offering, I think, again, there's one next Thursday, uh, covers stuff that we've already covered here. So it goes through, and uh, there might be some practice component of the, the screening or something along those lines. But um, uh, basically, uh, I, I think for you, it's redundant for, for what we've just done. Yep. A good question. Perfect. Um, yeah. Um, other than that, that's really it. Again, these slides will come out in the next day or two along with this recording to you guys. Um, as always, they will be posted on our coach resource page specifically for bowling that you can go to whenever. Um, and then I will also, before I do my, my thank you um, for you all attending tonight, um, last call for questions. If there's any questions of anything that we went over, um, if you, you know, get off this training tonight and, and this preseason webinar and kind of think, oh, I forgot to ask this, 
don't uh, hesitate to reach out. You guys all should have my email and most of you should probably have my cell phone at this point as well. Um, a uh, quick question from Tasha. Uh, the training on the 27th and 29th is principles of coaching, and that's for advanced coach certification. Um, so if you have any interest in one day taking a team to um, a national invitational tournament like they hold out in Las Vegas for bowling uh, every year or every other year, you would need that certification. If you have any interest in taking uh, or being the head coach for bowling for uh, USA games in 2022 in Orlando, or if there's ever a world games opportunity for a bowling coach, you would need that principles of coaching training. Um, and like Mike said, the next one is on the 27th and the 29th. It's a split training. Um, um, I, I would say it's also good content just as a coach. So uh, it is absolutely, as Zach indicated, a requirement to take any team or any athletes to the next highest level but there's also great value um, for you to move from being a head coach to an advanced coach and the content there is very helpful. Um, it is, uh, I should point out, it is for coaches who've had at least two years of experience as a coach. So we want you to have some experience under your belt. Um, but it's a good course, very interactive. Yeah, I, I'd like to, to personally say that I think Mike and I run a pretty fun course. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe that's just our perception. I think people had a good time with the last one. So uh, even if you're looking to just come and hang out with us and get a certification and, and grow your knowledge as a coach, again, feel free to come and join us on the 27th and 29th. Um, and then Tricia also said, um, there's a lot of good stuff in the uh, virtual return to play resources for getting our athletes up to speed. I think there's a lot of good stuff there. And a lot of my cycling coaches, uh, a different sport, prior to them going back in person for training, they had mandatory Zoom meetings with the uh, parents of any athletes or unified partners that were going to participate. And they went over a lot of the stuff that we went over tonight and showed a lot of those videos to the parents. Again, just to set expectations for everyone. Um, so then you can set the exact expectations of what you expect from the athletes, the unified partners, from volunteers, from parents across the board. So everybody's on the same page when you get to that first practice instead of trying to figure it out as you go. Um, Mike, I don't think I see any other questions. Has anything popped up on your end? Uh, no, the one thing I would, uh, just as a reminder, talk to your area leaders, talk to your area director, he or she or them, if you have multiple area directors, are gonna be key to you uh, getting things going. Um, and uh, um, again, uh, don't be worried about taking it slow. Yep. So other than that, um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out after this email, phone call, whatever it may be. Um, but thank you guys for being on tonight. We really appreciate you tuning in to get this information. I know a lot of you are excited to potentially get back at the bowling alley um, and get some work in, get to see your athletes. Um, and again, without you guys, none of this happens. Um, I cannot thank you guys year after year enough for all the work that you guys put in. Um, you guys make my job tremendously easy and I love seeing you guys year in and year out. So if there's anything that I can do to make this an easier upstart for you guys, please let me know and I'm more than happy to help. And other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed our presentation tonight. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Other than that, have a great night and we will see you guys hopefully at the bowling alley sometime soon.